Good afternoon and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Diana Barch will present Early Emergence of Depression, Understanding Risk Factors and Treatment. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $342 million. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Diana Barch. Dr. Barch is the Gregory B. Couch Professor of Psychiatry and the Chair of the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Barch is a four-time foundation grantee. She received the NARSAD Young Investigator Grant in 1995 and again in 2000, received the NARSAD Independent Investigator Grant in 2006, and most recently received the NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant in 2013. She's also the past president of the Society for Research in Psychopathology and is currently on the DSM-5 Revision Committee, the Steering Committee for the NIMH Research Domain Criteria Initiative, and is a member of the NIMH Scientific Council. Dr. Barch will discuss her research, which shows that early emerging depression is associated with alterations in brain structure, function, and connectivity. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Barch's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Barch and we will address as many of them as possible. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Diana Barch. Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I very much appreciate, um, uh, let me just try to move this off my screen here. I <laughs> very much appreciate being asked to speak today and I look forward to telling you about the work um, I've been doing in collaboration with my colleague Joan Luby trying to understand um, the factors that contribute to the early emergence of depression um, and ending up talking about the work we have ongoing in terms of some promising treatment approaches for young children with depression. Um, there we go. On the, if you can click. There we yep. go. All right, so for, I want to start before I uh, do my presentation just to thank a number of collaborators who've helped with the work here. Um, because uh, any research is really a team endeavor, and I in particular want to thank my colleague Joan Luby, a child psychiatrist here in the Department of Psychiatry, who has really been a driving force in the, the work on the causes and treatment of early onset depression. So the first thing you might be asking yourself if you're not familiar or you have not met a child with early onset depression is what the characteristics of preschool depression are. Um, in many ways, depressed preschoolers display very typical symptoms and signs of major depression. These include things like high levels of guilt, experiencing a loss of pleasure or joy, something that is really very you know, critical to childhood, extreme fatigue, being sad and tearful, and even having thoughts of death or play things associated with death. Uh, importantly, children, young children, preschoolers with depression are functionally and developmentally impaired and that's according to both the reports of their parents and to the reports of their preschool teachers or their daycare workers. 
So they not only experience many of the typical signs and symptoms of depression, but it also interferes with their life in important and you know very difficult ways. Um, one thing we might also be asking ourselves is whether this kind of early onset depression is just something that's temporary, do kids grow out of it, or does it really show similarity or continuity with depression that um, older children or adolescents or adults experience. So one of the things that we know now is that um, depression at a preschool age is actually unfortunately a very strong predictor of children continuing to have depression and meeting criteria for kind of full-blown depression at school age. We also know that having a family history of mood disorders is a strong predictor of subsequently developing depression. So having moms or dads in the family who have also experienced depression is a strong predictor. And importantly, we also know that preschoolers with depression have a much higher likelihood of having additional depression later on than other disorders like anxiety disorders or disruptive disorders. So we might refer to this as, as displaying homotypic continuity, meaning if you have this early onset depression, you are more likely to continue to have depression and have new episodes of depression than you are to develop other kinds of uh, forms of mental illness. So we've been trying to use brain imaging techniques that are available for studying uh, young children safely in order to try to understand whether children with a history of preschool onset depression show changes in brain function and structure that are similar to or maybe are kind of precursors of those same kinds of changes that are seen in adults with depression. And then importantly to ask whether these changes reflect what we might call scars of experiencing depression. So, you know, something that occurs once a child develops depression. Or whether in some cases at least some of these changes might be genetically influenced or caused by environmental factors that contribute to risk for them developing depression. And the reason why we want to make that distinction is because if they are risk factors, we can use this information to try to identify those children who might be at most risk for developing depression, and then to try to use that information to intervene before they develop depression, or even to predict, for example, treatment response. And, you know, just kind of as a side, we've been trying to push this earlier and earlier and earlier in development because I think we now have pretty good reason to believe that the longer children or adolescents or even adults live with, you know, the experience of depression or anxiety or any other, you know, forms of challenge, the more difficult it is to treat, the more, you know, possibility that, they, that they're kind of accumulating uh, difficulties that are going to be harder to change. And so in children, if we can intervene as early as possible, and ideally even before they've really started to develop serious, you know, signs or symptoms of depression, we can hopefully help kind of shift them back onto a healthy developmental trajectory so that they don't have to experience some of the challenges that they might otherwise have experienced, say, in school age or adolescent periods, where it can be, you know, very, very debilitating for kids to have depression or anxiety. So in order to try to understand where we might want to look in terms of understanding uh, brain changes in children with depression, it's important to look at what we know about the brain systems that are involved in adult and adolescent depression because there's already a great deal of work that's been done on adults and adolescents with depression that gives us some good clues. And let me start by orienting, orienting you to some models of the brain systems that are thought to be involved in emotion and emotion regulation. So what I'm showing you here is a, a, a graphic of a brain. This is a, a slice through the middle of the brain, and you're looking at sort of the middle surface of the brain. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. And what we have illustrated here are some of the key regions in the brain that we think are important for emotion processing and emotion regulation. So critically here um, is the amygdala and the ventral striatum. So these are parts of the brain that are very... Um, old in terms of, you know, they're, they are present in, you know, species other than humans. Um, they seem to be very important for understanding and processing emotion. Um, the amygdala has been associated in particular with responding to threat, threatening things in the environment, although it also responds when salient or important but good things happen. 
And the ventral striatum has been thought to be important for learning about what sorts of actions um, in the world lead to positive or negative outcomes. So these are really key brain structures that are important for learning about both good and bad events in the outside world. These structures communicate with other parts of the brain, including what people refer to as the medial prefrontal cortex, meaning kind of in the middle of the brain and the anterior cingulate. Um, and these regions in turn communicate to parts of the brain that are thought to be very important for controlling one's emotions or regulating one's emotions. So in particular, there's a region of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, which is something that is not completely uniquely human, but has been expanded in humans and is thought to be very important for uh, emotion regulation, control of behavior, understanding of social interactions and social situations. In addition, there's a part of the brain called the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a little bit further down, which is also thought to be important for what you might call the voluntary regulation of emotions, so deliberately trying to regulate your emotional responses. These regions of the brain here, the anterior cingulate, the medial prefrontal cortex, are thought to perhaps be more involved in sort of automatic regulation of emotion, um, not where you're necessarily really consciously trying to regulate, but sort of more automatic responses there. Just uh, the same information sort of presented in a different way is you can think of there being systems that are involved in emotion processing. I've talked about the amygdala. I've talked about the ventral striatum. There's another region of the brain that sits right next to the amygdala called the hippocampus that's also important for stress responding and, and shutting off stress responses. We talked about these parts of the brain in the middle here that are important for kind of automatic regulation of emotion. And then these parts of the brain like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that may be important for regulating emotion. So what we know in adults with depression is that um, there is a tendency for adults with depression to show increased activity or increased responding in regions involved in emotion processing, especially when they're processing negative information. And that includes things like negative facial expressions, movies that portray negative information, you know, things that might have themes of, of loss or sadness um, or anxiety. And this is thought to really be part of a, you know, a, a problem of kind of increased attention to or processing of negative information that may contribute to the experience of depression. And again, there's much, much data in adults and adolescents to suggest this is true among individuals who have depression. In addition, there's data to suggest that adults and adolescents with depression show reduced responsivity or reduced activation of brain regions that are involved in regulating or controlling emotion. So that's these brain regions over here, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, brain regions that we think are important for really trying to control or regulate your emotions. And then lastly, there's also data in adults and adolescents with depression suggesting that the communication between these two brain systems goes awry among individuals with depression. So we would call this connectivity or connections between these brain regions. Um, this can be structural connections having to do with the fibers in the brain that connect different regions of the brain and allow them to talk to each other. It can also be what we would refer to as functional connectivity or the degree to which the regions tend to show um, uh, similar patterns of brain activity over time. So now we know that adults and adolescents with depression show increased activity in these brain regions when processing negative information. They then show decreased activity in the brain regions that are involved in emotion regulation or emotion control. And they show abnormal connections between these systems. And the reason why abnormal connections may be relevant is if this kind of set of brain regions is supposed to help regulate this set of brain regions, if they can't talk to each other properly, these systems involved in emotion regulation are not going to be able to provide that sort of top-down control or regulation over emotion processing regions. So then the question becomes, what do we know about children with a history of preschool onset major depression? And do they show these same patterns? Um, and if they do, that gives us a sense that there is continuity again between this very early form of, 
of depression and, and depression that emerges later in life, but in terms of both the kind of the symptoms and the brain systems involved, and again, might give us some better clues about ways for early intervention and treatment. So first, the question we asked was, do these children with a history of preschool onset depression show increased activity in these emotion processing regions when they're responding to negative information? So to ask that question, we used data from a study that my colleague Joan Luby started a number of years ago. We refer to this as the preschool depression study. Um, and this study was started when the children were between the ages of three to six, and they were recruited from the community. They were oversampled for young kids who had early signs of depression using a screening checklist. It's called the pre preschool feelings checklist. And then children and their caregivers had continued to participate with us uh, now for you know, 10, in some cases 12, 13 years. And over the early years of the study, they participated in semi-structured diagnostic interviews that included sort of expanded assessment of depression and mania and anxiety in young children. And then we started recruiting folks to be involved in imaging, brain imaging, at about ways four and five when the children were entering the kind of school age period of about eight to ten. Um, we have some additional new studies that we've published uh, imaging kids who are already uh, preschoolers, who are currently preschoolers, but I'm not going to have time to talk about those today. Um, we have, uh, as I'll say a little bit later, we've now done three waves of uh, brain imaging with these children. They're now going into um, adolescence and early adulthood. And I'll show you a little bit later on some of the data looking at the, the trajectory of brain development over time or the patterns of brain development over time. And we're now following up with our kids as they're going into adolescence to kind of help understand, you know, how they're uh, coping with the, the kind of the unique challenges of adolescence and looking at, you know, who, who is able to be resilient and, you know, and not develop new episodes of depression versus those that you know, might still be having challenges in developing some new episodes of depression. Um, so in this study, what we did to look at how children were responding to negative uh, emotional information is we showed them um, pictures of faces that had different expressions. Um, so they either could be neutral expressions or sad expressions or happy expressions or fearful expressions. And we asked them to make a neutral judgment. We just asked them to tell us, is the face a male or female? And we did that because there was some evidence to suggest that um, these kinds of more automatic biases to attend to negative information um, show up more strongly when you're not focusing people's attention on the emotion. So here, we didn't tell them anything about paying attention to the emotion. We just said, tell us if it's a boy or girl. And then what we did was look at the patterns of brain activity when kids were looking at these different types of faces and asked how those patterns of brain activity were related to their early signs and symptoms of depression. Um, and in particular, we looked at depression severity from their very initial evaluation at the preschool age. Um, so let me just orient you to what you're seeing here. So this is another picture of the brain. Um, now it would be like I was kind of removing the top part of the brain and looking in. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. This is the left. This is the right. And what we're looking at are regions of the brain that are showing uh, activity when children are um, looking at sad faces. And what we see here is that kids with more severe depression at preschool show greater activity in response to sad faces in these regions of the brain that we talked about as involved in kind of, you know, automatic emotion processing, including the orbital frontal cortex. Um, and we see that those relationships to early onset depression hold even when you look at, say, other anxiety disorders or the development of ADHD or even how depressed they are at the time of the scan. So it really looks like there's something about this early depression severity that predicts continued increased activation in the brain to sad or negative faces, even when they're not necessarily supposed to be attending to the emotion expression. We also see this in the striatum. Um, and as you recall, I mentioned that the striatum was a part of the brain that responds to information about sort of rewards and losses in the environment. 
And then we also see it in the amygdala. And again, I mentioned the amygdala before as one of those key regions involved in processing information in the environment that might uh, indicate sort of threat or loss. So we see you know, evidence that how severe the depression is early on really predicts how much brain activation kids show even at school age when they are processing these sad faces. So we think this is evidence then that children with a history of preschool onset depression like adults with depression, like adolescents with depression, do show this increased responsivity in emotion processing brain regions when they're processing negative information. We then wanted to look at whether children with a history of preschool onset depression also showed decreased activity in these brain regions that are thought to be important for emotion regulation or emotion processing. So as you recall, I said before that we know from the work on adults and adolescents with depression that there's at least reasonable evidence that a lot of adults with depression show decreased activity um, in these emotion regulation regions. And so we wanted to ask whether something similar was going on in these children who had early onset depression. So to look at this, we used a slightly different task, although in the same children. Um, this was a, parent, uh, a, a way of looking at it developed by a collaborator at Stanford, Ian Gottlieb, who's done a lot of work on uh, girls who are at risk for depression because they have mothers with depression. And he's been interested in looking at how people try to explicitly regulate their emotions. And so what we do is during the brain imaging scan, we have them do a kind of a resting quiet scan where they're just resting quietly. And then we show them a film clip and then we ask them to try to elaborate on the mood generated by that film clip, to try to explicitly regulate their emotional response to that film clip. So they have a baseline scan. We just get their sort of resting brain activity. They watch a film clip for five minutes, and then we scan them for a minute while they're trying to consciously and deliberately regulate their emotional experience. So when we look at their self-report, about their mood ratings, um, we find that the healthy kids and the kids who'd experienced depression showed similar self-reports in terms of how much their mood changed after trying to do this emotion regulation. However, they showed fairly different patterns of brain activity during this emotion regulation uh, challenge. So here I'm showing you again uh, pictures of the brain. This is now the side of the brain. Um, in red um, are regions where, excuse me, I have to cough for a second, <clears throat> um, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where we see less activity in the children with depression and in the children with higher MDD severity. Um, so again, these regions of the brain, um, so these are the kids with depression and these are the kids with higher severity at the time of scanning, all show decreased activity in these brain regions that are thought to be important for emotion regulation. So again, this is, and we also see increased activity again in the amygdala while they're doing this emotion regulation. So increased activity in the brain regions that are thought to be responsible for emotion processing and decreased activity in the brain regions thought to be important for emotion regulation. So again, this is consistent with the adult and adolescent literature where children with this early onset depression are showing this decreased top-down, uh, decreased activity in brain regions thought to be important for top-down control over emotion processing. We then moved to ask, well, what about this question of, of how these brain systems are talking to each other, right? So as I said before, you know, we have evidence in adults that they're showing this increased activity in emotion processing regions, decreased activity in regulation regions, and evidence that those, those brain systems aren't talking to each other in a way that allows for effective emotion regulation. And so we wanted to know whether that was also true in children who had a history of early onset depression. But we also then wanted to start to ask about risk for depression. Do we also see this in kids who've never had depression, but who might be at risk for developing depression? Um, and by risk here, you know, what we meant was um, being the children of mothers um, who had experienced depression. So we know that having moms who've experienced depression 
um, uh, you know, unfortunately makes it more likely that their children may also experience depression. Um, and part of that is likely due to the genetic influences that we know have an influence on the likelihood of uh, being depressed. Um, but we also know that it's really challenging for moms and dads or any caretaker to try to, you know, parent and take care of a child when they're really suffering from depression. And that may unfortunately make it also a bit more challenging for the child as well. Um, so we had, um, uh, within our uh, study, the preschool depression study, we had really four groups of kids. Um, I've been focusing on the kids who had a history of major depression um, versus the kids who were healthy controls. But we can also look in our kids as to who had a mother with depression, um, whether or not they'd also experienced depression. So we have a subgroup of kids in our study who themselves have never been depressed, but who had moms who were depressed. So we have these kids in this graph in blue who had moms who were depressed but have never themselves been depressed. So they're at risk, but they haven't had it themselves. The kids in green have had depression, but they didn't have moms with depression. And then we have kids who unfortunately are kind of experiencing a double whammy where they themselves have had depression and they have moms with depression. And what we looked at was this connectivity between these two networks. Um, the network involved in emotion processing, including the amygdala and such, and then the network of brain regions involved in emotion regulation. And those regions normally show a negative relationship. So as activity is increased in emotion regulation regions, it's decreased in emotion processing regions, which is exactly what you'd expect if those you know, systems were controlling each other and regulating each other. And that's exactly what we see in our healthy kids who've never had depression. But as soon as we look at our kids who have experienced depression themselves, so these groups, or who've never experienced depression but have had a mom with depression, we see that all three of these groups of kids show reduced uh, coupling or communication between the emotion regulation and the emotion processing regions, which again is consistent with the idea or the, the prediction that those systems are having difficulty communicating with each other. Further, we looked at whether this predicted their self-reports of how well they could cope with sadness or deal with sadness. And what we found was that, um, the, so these kids over here are showing the, the pattern we expect, which is a nice negative relationship between these two systems. And these kids have very low self-reports of, of having emotion dysregulation. Um, so the kids who show the pattern of brain connectivity that we'd expect do not say that they have a lot of problems dealing with sadness. On the other hand, the kids over here who say, I have a lot of problems with sadness dysregulation are the ones who are not showing this normal negative relationship between these two brain systems. So not only do we see that this coupling or communication is reduced in kids with depression and who are at risk for depression, but it predicts their self-reports of how well they feel like they cope or deal with sadness. So before I go on to broader effects, just to kind of summarize, you know, and this is really just the, the you know, kind of a tip of a, a, a growing literature now suggesting that in many ways, the kinds of uh, brain changes that we see in kids very young who develop depression are very similar to those same things that we see in adults and adolescents with depression, really suggesting that it's part of the same illness. Um, and further, um, it seems to be the case that at least some of these changes are present in kids who have not yet experienced depression but are at risk for developing depression. Again, suggesting that they might be a predictor, of which kids might be at the highest risk. Those results that I all showed you though were just from kind of our very first wave of imaging with these kids when they were in school age. And as I mentioned before, we've now followed them into adolescence and we've been able to look at the development, brain development or brain trajectories across the course of adolescence. Um, and so we've been able to just recently look at what is the relationship between having experienced depression and then brain development across this longer period of time. Um, so what we've had now is these three imaging ways where we've been able to measure brain structure and brain function. 
And then as you recall, we have all these early measurements of depression. Um, so we have severity scores from many different ways of imaging. So we really have a nice um, history with these children to know like, you know, how frequently have they experienced depression, how severe has it been over time. And what we did was to look at does the severity sort of over time predict brain development across um, school age and adolescence? Um, so let me just uh, unpack what I'm showing you here. What I'm showing you here is a graph of um, whole brain gray matter volume. So gray matter in the vein is, is the juicy stuff where all the neurons live, um, that, uh, the parts of the brain that do sort of all the information processing and thinking and memory and emotion. And we know that in healthy kids, uh, the volume of the brain goes up until you're about 10 or 11, and uh, that has to do with the sprouting of new connections among different parts of the brain. Um, but then when you're about 10, 11, 12, um, you actually start to get pruning um, and sort of a fine-tuning of connections in the brain. And you get rid of the connections that you really don't need, and you hone in on the connections that you really do need. And then brain volume starts to decrease, and it keeps decreasing uh, for good or for bad, the rest of your life. Um, and so the normal pattern that we would expect to see as kids are going through adolescence is a decrease in brain volume. So if you look at this line in blue here, these are kids who've not experienced much depression. We normally expect to see a decrease in, in gray matter volume, even among healthy kids. But what we found was that the more severe your early experience of depression, the steeper your decline in gray matter volume over time. So this purple line here are the kids who'd experienced the most severe depression across preschool and kind of early school age. And they show the steepest decline in gray matter volume over time. Um, and unfortunately, that steeper decline in gray matter volume is associated with greater difficulties with emotion regulation as they go into adolescence, a, a really critical time where we need kids and teenagers to be able to, you know, be as effective as possible at regulating their emotions because we know that that's a, a period of life where, you know, that's very challenging and, you know, that's kind of one of the big um, challenges of adolescence is learning to be able to deal with social interactions and to regulate your emotion. And so these kids who've experienced this more severe early depression are showing this steeper decline in brain volume and it's associated with more difficulties regulating emotions. So I've hopefully given you at least a hint of the data suggesting that there are these changes in brain structure and brain function that are associated with early onset depression and that it predicts depression. Um, but the really critical question is, can we do something about this? Can we really change this pathway for kids early on so that they don't have to go through school age and adolescence experiencing depression in a way that might be further, you know, harmful or detrimental to their development? Um, fortunately, my colleague Joan Luby has really been starting to look at what sorts of treatments might be effective for early onset depression. And, and we've been trying to look at how early can we administer these treatments to try to shift kids back onto a healthier developmental trajectory. Um, so we know, as I said, that there are other, these alterations. We know there are these genetic and psychosocial risk factors. We know they influence brain development. So these early psychosocial interventions, because we you know, typically don't want to do something invasive in children because they've still got these lovely developing brains. So we want to think about psychosocial interventions that might be effective and helpful, but not invasive and not harmful in and of themselves. Um, and so where we focused is on early psychosocial interventions that are focused on helping kids to develop healthy emotion regulation and healthy emotion processing. And the, the type of treatment that we've been looking at is something called parent-child interaction therapy emotion development. Now that's a long name, um, but the first part of it, parent-child interaction therapy, is actually borrowing from a set of therapies that have been shown to be um, relatively effective for other disorders, like disruptive disorders in kids, things like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but really modifying it and extending it to focus on emotion development. Um, so it uses principles and techniques such as what's referred to as a bug in the ear where moms or dads, depending on who's the primary caretaker, 
um, work with the therapist to develop and to use more effective techniques in teaching children how to regulate their emotions. And so they might literally have a microphone in their ear and be getting coaching from a therapist while they're interacting with their child. Uh, they work on parenting style. They work on homework for things for the child and the parent to do together at home during the, the weeks in between therapy to help the child to develop more effective emotion regulation strategies. Um, and it's really addressing two sets of problems in emotion reactivity. So, so far today I've mostly focused on talking about the sort of negative side of things, this increased reactivity to negative emotions that we know is very characteristic of depression. But one of the other things that I haven't talked about yet, but what we also know is very characteristic of depression, is actually a reduced response to positive or joyful outcomes. And if you might recall, at the beginning of this talk when I was introducing what are the signs and symptoms of depression in kids, one of the things I mentioned was reduced pleasure or lack of joy. And that's one of the things that's really striking when you work with these kids with early onset depression. You know, one of the lovely things about little kids is they're just their joy and their exuberance and how much pleasure they get out of life. And these kids who have early depression, you don't see that, right? They're not taking that same sort of, you know, unfettered pleasure and joy in life. And so this therapy is really designed to do two things. One is to help kids to reduce their responses or control their responses to negative events or experiences, but also to help them augment pleasure and joy, you know, and their ability to, you know, really upregulate positive emotions as well. The treatment focuses on the, the parent's role in helping the kid to uh, regulate their own emotion because at this early age, kids really do need that help from a parent. Um, and it uses sort of emotionally evocative tasks in the session to really help the parent and the child be able to practice those skills right there with the therapist, you know, so that they will hopefully be able to continue to use those skills at home when similar situations arise in everyday life. Um, and so the hope is that this therapy will really help young children to develop emotionally, both in terms of enhancing positive emotions and in regulating negative emotions. So um, just to kind of give you an example of how this might work, so here's a therapist. Um, Here's a, a, a mom and a child who are working on a task together, and the therapist is coaching the mom as she's working with her child, you know, to help, again, help the child learn how to regulate negative emotions and to upregulate positive emotions. So there was, we first did a, a, an early single, what we would call an um, a open label study, um, where we looked at uh, reductions in child depression so um, here are kids who went through the PCIT-ED, which is the Parent-Child Interaction Therapy Emotion Development Treatment, and here are the kids who are in a weightless control. And so this was the parent-reported depression in the child pre-treatment and post-treatment, and there was a significant reduction in the kids who were in the active treatment, not a significant reduction in the control treatment, although everybody did get a little bit better. Um, then we looked at family impairment. So these are self-reports of how uh, challenged the family is. And again, we saw a significant reduction um, in family impairment as the children went through this treatment. Um, and it was not a significant reduction in the control group. And then we also looked at how much stress the parent reported experiencing. And so again, um, the, the moms or dads who went through treatment reported that their parenting stress reduced following treatment compared to the kids who were in the weightless control. So this was early promising evidence that this kind of intervention might be effective in helping to reduce child depression, reduce family impairment, and to reduce parenting stress for the parent as well. So we've now followed up with this with a much larger randomized clinical trial that we currently have ongoing. Um, and importantly, in this randomized clinical trial, we're now adding in or integrating um, measures of brain function in two ways. One, looking at whether our measures of brain function might be able to predict which kids are going to have the most positive response to treatment. And also as a means of trying to understand exactly how and why this treatment might be working. 
Um, so what we're doing in this study, oh, I just said that. Um, so it's telling us both about who's going to predict and what the mechanisms of change might be. And if we can better understand the mechanisms of change, we might be able to further improve that uh, treatment. Um, the hope, too, I wish this wasn't true, but sometimes we find that you know, in terms of impacting public policy and awareness and need for early treatment, sometimes showing that it, it's changing brain function can get attention in a way that we might not otherwise be able to. Um, so this is the design of the current treatment trial. Um, let me just orient you to it. So it's an 18-week treatment. Um, parents and their children come in every week for 18 weeks. The first five weeks are what we call the child-directed part. Um, and it's focused on the child. Then the next five weeks are the parent-directed part, and it's focused more on the parent. And then the last eight weeks is really a dyadic focus on the parent and the child, and specifically focusing on emotion regulation. So here, the idea is to help the child get a little bit more self-control. Here is helping to support the parent and helping them to develop some skills. And now this is putting it to work for both of them. Um, and then we have a waitlist control, and then these children are offered treatment following the 18-week waitlist control if they're still experiencing depression. Um, so we start at baseline using two different measures of brain function and structure. So we use fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging. The data I showed you all before earlier was all using this technique. And then we've also added in a new technique called um, evoked response potentials, which are another way of measuring brain function and measuring brain responses to both positive and negative things. Um, and I'll show you a little in a minute what that looks like. Then um, we have an assessment here with the um, behavior, and then we do ERPs again here, and then we do ERPs and fMRI again at the end of treatment. And then we actually follow kids out for another 12 weeks and do ERPs again. Um, so this is a picture of our fMRI scanner, and we go to a great deal of effort to try to get kids comfortable um, with scanning. Uh, we have videos for them to watch ahead of time. We have what we call a mock scanner that's very child-friendly, and the kids get to come in and um, scan Dr. Monkey themselves, so they get to see what it's like for Dr. Monkey to go in the scanner and to experience it. Um, and we find that, you know, many, many kids really find this very fun and enjoyable. They get a picture of their brain. They're excited about it. Um, there are some kids who just don't want to do it, and that's fine. They, they certainly don't have to in order to be involved in the treatment. Then we also use ERPs. And so ERPs actually measure the electrical activity that's happening on the top of the scalp. And we use these little caps. Um, and we have a... Uh, uh, connectors here that connect to the computer and allow us to measure that electrical act brain activity. A lot of kids really like these ERPs because they're fun. They get to see what's going on. They do some tasks on the computer using a game controller that lets us look at their responses to positive and negative outcomes. Um, and as I mentioned before, here we're really, the treatment is really focused on two things. One, it's focused on helping kids how to learn to reduce responses to negative emotions and negative reactivity, but also learning how to increase their response to reward or positive outcomes. And we think that both of these things are really critical to understanding depression. Um, I didn't have time today to talk about the work that we did as our uh, most recent NARSAT award, but that really focused on this part of the equation, looking at um, responsiveness to reward and brain connectivity associated with reward um, in relationship to risk for depression. And, and we again see that um, kids who are at risk for depression by virtue of having a mom with depression show reduced positive responses to positive outcomes and that that predicts the severity of kind of subclinical symptoms of depression. So again, we think that both of these aspects are really key in order to help kids develop a more healthy emotion regulation system, both to reduce their response to negative experiences and to increase their response to positive experiences. So this treatment trial is ongoing now. We're about a third of the way through, um, and we hope to finish in the next two years. Um, and again, if we do, again, see positive outcomes, um, we'll be able to look at whether or not any of our ERP or fMRI measures either predict which kids are actually having the most positive response and whether it and to look at the mechanisms of change potentially as a way of further enhancing the treatment.
So in conclusion, um, hopefully what I've uh, given you a hint about today is the growing literature showing that children with early depression really do show changes in brain function and structure that are similar to those seen in adults. They show increased activity of emotion processing regions in response to negative stimuli, decreased activity in brain systems involved in emotion regulation, disrupted communication between those brain systems, and you know changes in the trajectory of brain decline and growth over development. Um, we think there's at least some evidence that some of these may actually be risk factors for depression, not just scars of experiencing depression. And we hope that we can use this information to really enhance our tr effective treatment of early onset depression so that we can intervene before kids go on to kind of a repeated, you know, uh, set of episodes of depression that might really disrupt their development as they go into adolescence and adulthood. So I will stop there and uh, turn it back over to the folks, uh, to Dr. Bornstein. Yes, yes, th thank you, thank you. Um, what a great presentation. Um, you, you really were able to explain this important information in a way that um, lay people can understand. And we received a number of questions, one of which, a couple of which, um, asked for a little bit more about the importance of early detection and why that is so key. And I'd like to see if you could say a little bit more about that early detection issue. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the analogy I like to think about is, uh, imagine uh, you were talking about children who had difficulties reading, right? Um, and imagine that we didn't detect that children had difficulties reading until they were adults. And now they've spent their entire childhood and adolescence you know, not being able to access certain experiences, not being able to shape brain development you know, with the rich information that's available out there through reading. And you go in now as an adult and you try to go back and teach children how to read, it's very difficult to do that as effectively as you would like when they're adults because there may be some critical periods in development where children are best able to learn new skills and abilities um, or where that might shape brain development. And I think something is very similar and true of depression as well. You know, if, if kids are experiencing depression, they're, you know, they're living with negative thoughts and feelings and emotions those negative thoughts, feelings, and emotions may be having their own impact on brain development. It may be having an impact on the development of their social relationships, their relationships with their families, and so on. And it may be sort of a negative spiral, right, that, you know, the depression changes how you're experiencing the world, and that in turn changes brain development, and you're kind of, you know, spiraling out on a different pathway. And when you finally do intervention now, the child's very far down this pathway, it may be harder to kind of bring them all the way back. Whereas if you intervene early, before they started to go down that pathway, you may allow them to have more positive experiences across the course of development that may facilitate social development, emotional development, intellectual development in a way that means that they never experience those negative uh, outcomes in the first place. The, I I, I think that's a, a, a great explanation and a, one of the things that I often think about and where the field of psychiatry is going is in the past we waited for a person to have a heart attack and then we started to treat their high blood pressure and diet and exercise, etc. And now we're proactive in order to avoid the heart attack. Exactly. And by being proactive we can avoid some of the damage that's done. Exactly. That's an even better analogy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to ask a little bit about your last point um, related to that the evidence that these are not just scars but are also associated with risk. And where does that tease out? Where do you see that going as you continue the work on this? So I think what we'd like to do is, um, you know, so as, as there's increasing evidence for this, what we'd like to start to think about, is there a practical way to incorporate that kind of information into early detection approaches um, so that we can really start to identify kids before um, parents are already feeling the need to bring them in for treatment, right? Uh, 
So you can think about things like earlier screening, you know, in pediatric pediatrician settings, um, whether that be through sort of self-report measures or parental report measures or even, you know, safe and non-invasive brain imaging techniques. Um, you know, I think it's not going to be feasible to do brain imaging, you know, sort of in primary in schools and that sort of thing. But, you know, to the extent that we can identify risk markers that are either behavioral or based on imaging that would allow us to, you know, go into the community, I think of this in many ways as the, um, the movement among, you know, families with children who experience autism. There was really a movement to push for earlier and earlier detection of kids at risk for development of autism and to use that for early intervention. I think we need to be moving in a very similar way in terms of, you know, early mood disorders and depression to the extent that we can identify things that are reliable predictors or risk factors. Can we be starting to assess those things in, you know, primary care, pediatric care, schools, daycares, those sorts of things, you know, and to the extent that we have an effective intervention that we can offer, then, you know, again, we could we don't have to wait until it becomes an emergent problem. Well, what guidance would you give to uh, a parent, a mother or a father who are listening right now to the webinar who have a concern about their child, that there's something they think just might not be going right for them? What should they do? Well, I would always say the first thing to do is to talk to your pediatrician, and I think pediatricians are increasingly being trained on how to detect um, early onset, you know, mood disorders and other sorts of things and to be able to make appropriate referrals. Um, you know, if that's not possible or you're maybe not getting the response that you want, you know, to don't hesitate to ask for an evaluation from a psychologist or a child psychiatrist you know, to find out maybe, you know, are, should I be worried about these early signs and symptoms? And if so, what are the treatment options that are available in my local community? Um, again, I think, you know, there's an increasing awareness on the part of both pediatricians and certainly has always been true for child psychiatrists of the need for early intervention. I think it's sometimes very difficult, and I can say this as a parent of two children myself, it's sometimes really difficult to know What's just normal development? You know, kids normally have, you know, emotion difficulties at different stages of development, and some of that is just typical, and sometimes it's more than just typical, and sometimes it's difficult to know where is my child? Is this just what I would, should be expecting normally, or is this more? And I would say you don't need to make that decision yourself, right? Like that's a good time to, to get another opinion to visit a psychiatrist, a pediatrician, a psychiatrist, and, and get some advice and feedback, you know, is this just the normal range of behavior, and, and it very well may be, or is my child really starting to experience some early challenges that we might want to think about some early intervention in order to help them, you know, kind of get back on a healthier developmental trajectory. So the, the message is, if a parent is concerned they shouldn't just be quiet about it. They exactly. should really speak to the pediatrician, get some guidance for yep. this. Yep, exactly. The, the um, early results that you're showing for the parent-child uh, interaction therapy um, for emotional development is, you know, seems very, very positive. I'm wondering if there are techniques that are used in that therapy that might be useful to parents in general even if their child isn't necessarily at risk or developing early signs of depression? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, definitely and absolutely. I mean, the first two modules, the parent and the child-focused modules, are really more general modules focused on sort of, you know, improving, you know, skills in both the child and the parent. Um, and they, they certainly can be helpful for kids who are having challenges in a you know, whether it's anxiety or depression or, you know, attention, but they're likely to be helpful even, you know, just to healthy kids, although, you know, some parents may be already using some of those skills and abilities. Um, uh, you know, they, I think we think they're probably going to be even more effective for kids who are having, you know, some early challenges, but I, I, I absolutely agree with you that there, you know, it could be the case that they would be helpful even for kids who either were not having very many problems at all or were just, you know, healthy kids. Right. That even, and in the example we cited before where a parent uh, 
goes to the pediatrician and the pediatrician says, this is all, you know, this is, everything's fine, we'll keep an eye on it, but maybe there are some techniques there that could help you um, be more comfortable and more skills is, you know, if we, we all go to school, but none of, none of that teaches us how to be parents, but there are some skills that could be helpful. Um, right, and I know parent. there are some preschools and, and, you know, grammar schools that are starting to see really the benefit of, you know, some explicit uh, discussion and learning and training in emotion regulation with kids, you know, um, it, just among healthy kids because it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, if, if it can be beneficial across the range, you know, why not help kids get a leg up, right? And and again, sort of emotion regulation and social interactions are the big developmental challenges that kids face throughout the course of their school age and adolescence. And, and the, the shape that takes changes across the course of development. So what you can expect a preschooler to do and what they need to do is different than what you can expect a school age child to do or an adolescent to do. But there is continuity there in the need for age appropriate emotion regulation and social interaction skills and to the extent that that can be you know part of even just you know the sort of normal skills that we learn in school might be really beneficial for a lot of children yes I, I think that's a very very important point and um, and as there's more evidence that shows the benefit both for children who may be at risk or may be ill um, but also for children who don't have any problems, but who can get the benefit. Hopefully, there'll be a greater use of this um, exactly. and availability of this. I, I want to go to have you speak a little bit more about the issue of pruning and how it relates to um, depression uh, in these children. We've seen recent headlines in the lay press about scientific studies about pruning and schizophrenia. Right. Um, and I, so I'd like to ask you to say a few words for our audience about this issue of pruning. Sure. Um, so pruning is something that we think happens normally um, during later childhood and adolescence where, you know, the brain, um, the, the way I like to think of it is the brain is um, kind of a smart thing that likes to have backup plans. And so early in the course of development, it, it creates lots of connections between neurons and brain regions that it might not need later. And, you know, as we go into later development, the brain will start to prune out those connections that aren't really needed. And the idea is that that's both uh, saving energy and metabolism because you don't have to support those connections. And it also helps the brain to be a, a more efficient information processor. But there may be a number of different mechanisms that alter the speed at which that's happening or the strength with which this, that's happening. And the... The recent lay press information on schizophrenia was really focusing on genetic influences that um, alter uh, the kind of genetic control of synaptic pruning. In depression, we don't know yet what might be leading to this. Um, my, I'm, I'm going to tell you what my hypothesis is, and I want to make it really clear. This is, this is a, a, a guess or a hypothesis, not something that I have data for. Um, one of the other things that we know can lead to changes in brain volume and connections over time is the experience of stress. Um, so stress activates brain systems such as the what's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It uh, activates a release of hormones, a cascade of hormones in the brain. And if we can't shut that off, it can have negative effects on the brain. Um, it can lead to what some people Kind of the fancy word for it is excitotoxic, meaning if you have parts of the brain that are sort of overactive for too long, it might actually be toxic for parts of those brain, for those parts of the brain. So if kids with depression are, you know, experiencing increased negative responses and difficulty controlling responses to stress or negative, you know, uh, emotions, it's at least theoretically possible that over time that really has a toxic effect on the brain. Um, and that that might be contributing to some of these changes in brain volume that could reflect increased pruning. Again, that's a hypothesis. I don't have data to say that's true, but I think it's something that would be worth, you know, trying to understand and look at in future research. 
Well, I appreciate you sharing the hypothesis because part of what we we aim to do in our webinar series is not only give information as to what's been found, but really show how science works. And this is an example of you based on what you've done already and the data that you have, starting to develop a new hypothesis and then ways to measure that. So right. thank you for sharing that sure with us. And, and, and I want to, um, as we close, say, uh, Deanna, thank you very much for taking the time to do this webinar. And more importantly, thank you for the research that you and the, the team of collaborators that you work with have been doing and continue to do. Um, this is research that um, is having and will have a tremendous impact. So thank you very, very much. I well, and thank you it. for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank um, everybody who joined us today and remind you that all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. And if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit our webinar page at our website. And I hope that you'll join us again next month when Dr. David Milkowitz, Professor of Psychiatry in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the UCLA Semmel Institute, will present a webinar entitled Adolescents with Bipolar Disorder, Tips on Coping for Families. This will take place on Tuesday, March 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.